years ago, an independent professional investment organization was set up to invest the Canada Pension Plan on behalf of the millions of working and retired Canadians. It had a very clear goal, which is to earn the best possible investment returns. And today, CPP Investments invests across public equities, private equities, bonds, private debts, real estate, infrastructure, and many other areas. All in order to build a resilient, globally diversified portfolio and to grow the CPP fund to help ensure the financial security of millions of Canadians now and for generations to come. Hello. A warm welcome to everyone in Ontario joining us today. Thank you for making the time to be with us at our public meeting. My name is Heather Monroe Bloom, and I have the pleasure of serving as chair of CPP Investments, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. Every two years, we hold public meetings with Canadians. It's our commitment to update you on how we are investing the CPP fund to help ensure it will be there for many years to come and to provide you with an opportunity to ask questions directly to our leadership. CPP is an important foundation for Canadians in retirement. Understanding the fund's performance and sustainability will provide information and reassurance regarding how it fits into planning for your future. This year, against the backdrop of the global pandemic, we're holding these meetings virtually. We believe this is the safest way to provide you with a full report on our work, while at the same time giving you an opportunity to ask questions. In developing today's program, we talked with numerous Canadians in advance. We wanted to determine what questions you might like us to address. Over the next 20 minutes, we will touch on many of these topics, including our approach to sustainable investing and how we design a resilient CPP fund for the long term. We will also share our most recent financial performance, and you will hear from our CEO, his perspective on the current global economic situation. Finally, we have 35 minutes set aside to answer your questions. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will do our utmost to respond during the question period, and if not, we'll follow up with you after the broadcast. 10 years ago, I joined the board of CPP Investments and I was honored to become chairperson in 2014. Over these years, our steadfast goal has been to provide the highest standard of governance and oversight at CPP Investments. Let me begin by saying a few words about how we do this on your behalf. In a challenging and rapidly changing environment, sound governance plays a critical role in ensuring that CPP Investments continues to meet its obligations to each of you the 20 million Canadians who contribute to the CPP fund and those that rely on it as part of their financial security in retirement. CPP Investments operates at arm's length from federal and provincial governments and is guided by the independent, highly qualified professional board of directors, which I am privileged to chair. Our governance structure is designed to support a clear goal to invest the funds that come in from contributors, maximizing returns without incurring excessive risk. In addition, the assets in the CPP fund are strictly segregated from all government funds and are thus protected from any political interference. Our board is comprised of experienced individuals with the skill sets and expertise needed to provide effective oversight of this global investment organization. The board is also diverse with a wide range of relevant professional backgrounds and global experience. We are each committed to serving the key public purpose of the fund. We are strong believers in the value of transparency and open dialogue and mindful of the important role entrusted to us to help ensure the CPP remains sustainable for future generations. That's why each year we publish an annual report of our financial performance and in it, other important information which you can find on our corporate website. And every two years, we hold public meetings across Canada to answer questions from Canadians. Over the past 24 months, the board has continued its ongoing commitment to continually enhancing our governance. This has included approving the next phase of the organization's long-term strategic direction, a renewed focus on conduct and culture, 
and further strengthening of our risk management practices. Last year, the board approved a new integrated risk framework for the organization, and this year, the board created a standing risk committee that oversees this area. Our approach looks at all risks holistically, from those that stem from investment decisions to those posed by financial markets. We also keep an ongoing watch over emerging threats, such as climate change, cybersecurity, and geopolitical risks. Our ongoing crisis preparedness has positioned us to respond quickly to the COVID-19 pandemic. Through 2020, the board has worked closely with management to ensure the fund is well positioned to manage through the significant financial and operational impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Acknowledging these unprecedented circumstances, my fellow directors and I are confident that management is taking every appropriate step to weather these exceptional challenges to best of ability. We continue to have strong conviction in the organization's planning for the long term. Our highly constructive and collaborative relationship with management enables us to work together on the evolution of our strategy. Management understands their role in executing the strategy and the board's role remains focused on oversight and guidance. Our 2025 business strategy, approved two years ago, is designed to keep us well positioned to mitigate future financial disruptions and to capitalize on new growth opportunities in the years ahead. We strive to remain a leader in realizing global governance best practices for our industry, and we actively promote strong governance practices, not only in CPP investments, but in all of the companies in which we invest. In doing so, we continue to represent the very best interests of you, our contributors and beneficiaries across Canada. On behalf of the Board of Directors and Management, we're united in our commitment to the highest standards of corporate governance, and we're proud to be recognized internationally as a leader in pension plan management. I'm very pleased to report that your CPP fund is in strong, capable hands under the leadership of our CEO, Mark Machen. I would now like to turn it over to Mark to share a few words with you. Thank you, Heather. We're living in extraordinary times. The global pandemic continues to impact people, communities, and economies. It's altered our lives and how we live. And while this is not the first disease to spread around the world, this pandemic is casting a long shadow. Health officials and governments are learning many things about COVID-19 with better treatments, testing, and the global race to develop and produce a viable vaccine well underway. Yet there's much more we need to know. It's this uncertainty and the start stop of reopenings that's adversely impacting confidence in global economies. And Canada is not immune. Our economists at CPP Investments project the world economy will contract by 3.4% this year, a stark reversal from the 2.8% growth anticipated at the beginning of the year. Yet we're now starting to see improvements in many parts of the world where the economies are emerging from lockdowns and are now turning back to growth. In Canada, as businesses and retail have started to reopen, recovery has begun. However, it will likely be slow and extend well into 2021. All of you across Canada, from coast to coast to coast, have been deeply impacted. But there's one thing you don't need to worry about, and that's the financial security of the CPP fund. We invest the CPP fund to weather all types of storms. And while a global pandemic of this magnitude is rare, the likelihood of a big event affecting financial markets is more frequent. We not only anticipate, we prepare for moments like this. Over the past decade, we've enhanced our risk management practices and, and properly prepared a financial crisis plan, business continuity practices, and even a pandemic response plan. So when the pandemic hit, we quickly moved from nine offices globally to more than 1,800 home offices, continuing to invest the CPP fund with the same skill, professionalism, and good judgment to help protect your retirement security. The strength of our long-term investing approach is a well-diversified portfolio that helps to ensure the fund is resilient. We invest across the globe in a wide range of industries and asset classes to ensure the investments are diversified and not dependent on just one area. 
And this minimizes the risk to the fund and helps us to earn the best possible returns over the long term. Right now, the global pandemic is actually accelerating growth in healthcare, technology, data infrastructure, and renewable energy. And that's where we're making investments amongst many other diverse sectors. We're also looking closely at emerging opportunities created by the new habits likely to shape our post-COVID world. Opportunities such as the rise of e-commerce and online grocery, the adoption of telehealth, the increase in remote work, the creation of new complex supply chains, and the shift in population away from urban centers. We expect some of these to be long lasting and will create significant investment opportunities for the future. Over the next 12 to 18 months, we expect the global economy will bounce back, albeit slowly. But whatever happens, you can continue to trust the CPP will be there for you for many years to come. Here's a short report on our performance. At CPP Investments, we never lose sight of our long-term objectives in our daily work. Maximize investment returns for the CPP fund and minimize risk to help provide financial security for generations of Canadians. The fund grew to $434.4 billion as of June 30th, 2020, a $33.8 billion increase over the past 12 months. Our active management strategy and the strength of the diversified investment portfolio we've built over the years allowed us to weather the storm as the world faced extreme challenges this year. We can't always predict the future, yet we do plan for it. Our sophisticated investors take a disciplined long-term approach to diversify the fund across geographies and asset classes, maximizing our returns over a long horizon against a wide range of possible events. That's why the true test of our performance is our long-term results. In the last 10 years, we earned 10.7% net nominal return, or $259.8 billion in net income after all costs. Investing today with an eye to the future, we're building a portfolio designed to grow and generate returns over time. This year, we continue to make significant investments in innovative healthcare and advanced technologies, infrastructure, autonomous vehicles, and renewable energy, all critical in the years to come. Now, as we look ahead to a period of uncertainty, we will stay on course with our long-term investing strategy, prudently manage our capital, and closely manage our existing portfolio of investments, We'll continue to stress test our portfolio as we always do, looking at optimal diversification and strong investment returns under a variety of future scenarios. This way, we can be confident that the fund will continue to deliver decades of steady performance. It's why the latest report from the Chief Actuary of Canada confirmed that the fund remains sustainable for at least 75 years. While our daily lives may have changed, the sustainability of the CPP fund has not. Our sound long-term strategy is essential now more than ever. We'll continue to invest and grow the fund for millions and millions of Canadians as a critical part of their financial security today and for many years ahead. At CPP Investments, we believe sustainable investing is simply smart long-term investing. We have a clear goal to maximize return without undue risk of loss. Effectively managing environmental, social, and governance factors creates sustainable value over the long term. Ten years ago, we set up a group to look at environmental, social, and governance risks. And that group has grown from two people to 15 people today that look at investments across the organization to assess these risks. We recently updated our policy on sustainable investments to more clearly articulate the business case for doing this and our expectations of corporates with respect to how they integrate ESG considerations into their strategy and operations. When it comes to actively engaging with companies, we focus on five key areas. Water, one of the world's most critical resources. Human rights, because companies that don't respect human rights face potential operational turmoil, higher legal risks, lack of community support, and damage to their reputation. Executive compensation, we see clear evidence of long-term shareholder value when there is alignment between executive pay and company performance. Board effectiveness, Having a diverse board in place to guide strategy and oversee risks is critical to achieving superior financial performance. 
we have a global board gender voting practice to take a stand for increased representation of women on corporate boards around the world. In 2020, CPP Investments voted against the election of directors at 323 international companies for not having any women on their boards. And finally, climate change, one of the most significant global challenges of our time. Climate change is one of the big issues of our generation. And as long-term investors, we need to think about both the risks and opportunities that climate change present. Climate change creates investment opportunities as well. For example, in renewable energy, where we've made investments in wind energy, in solar energy, and another one would be electric vehicle charging stations. We think that's gonna be a, a, an important piece of infrastructure in the future where there are more and more electric vehicles on the road. Over the last year, all major transactions have incorporated climate change due diligence. We've reviewed over 100 transactions worth more than $100 billion. We aim to deliver the investment teams and their investment committees clear line of sight of both the climate risks and opportunities associated with the investment, but also approaches to managing those risks or capturing those opportunities where we proceed with the investment. One thing that we're really excited about is something that's happening here in Canada, which is an investment that we've made into carbon capture technology that we think could be really important in the future. Meeting the needs of almost 8 billion people on the planet today is already creating tipping points with respect to water stress, pollution, income inequality, and many more factors. Consumer Consumers' expectations are quickly changing in response to this, and the number of companies that have failed to realize this and destroyed considerable shareholder value continues to grow. To be a successful investor in this new century, we have to be able to identify the companies proactively managing this reality, but also those failing to capture the risks and opportunities of this new century. In some ways, the pandemic has pulled forward the future in terms of change. So now we have an opportunity to invest in things like climate change, where we can put our money to work in things that will help us have a more prosperous, sustainable, and healthy environment. I don't think that many of us have really thought long term about how we're going to save up for retirement. And when we do think about it, it's usually that retirement is a long way out. Young people are concerned about buying their first home and settling into their careers. Retirement isn't on their radar. Many people don't have access to company pension plans that may have been available for previous generations. And on top of that, many people are struggling to save for retirement. Having the enhancements to the CPP is critically important to their financial security in retirement. The increased benefits are really important for Canadians in the long term. It's going to provide a stronger and more stable income for today's generation and for future beneficiaries. Canadians to know that the CPP will be there for them when they retire. It's a foundation for their retirement that they can count on. A lot of our investments globally are very long term. We really make the best investments through our intensive research deep dives into specific industries or sectors. I think it's great that we have a separate organization that actually manages the money on behalf of Canadians that's sustainable for the long term and it will be there for people when they retire. Whether you're starting in your career or you're nearing retirement, it's important to the social fabric of our country. I get to see firsthand the bright, talented minds that work at CPP Investments. It's inspiring to see how many people are dedicating their lives to growing the fund and working towards a very important public purpose. At CPP Investments, we design a portfolio to help ensure the CPP is strong, resilient, and sustainable for the long term. Our team of professional investors invests around the world in public and private assets like stocks, bonds, real estate, and infrastructure. 
Together, this delivers a well-balanced, globally diversified portfolio that will help achieve higher returns over a very long horizon and materially above what can be achieved through a low-cost passive investment strategy. In designing a portfolio, the first step is looking at the risk. What is the appropriate risk target? Because we have to take some amount of risk in order to earn returns. We consider market losses or short-term volatility, reputational risk, and the ability to sustain a long-term strategy. We have to balance short-term risk with longer-term returns. If we took an insufficient amount of risk, we would not be able to sustain the plan in the longer term. But on the other hand, if we took too much risk, there'd be more volatility in the near term and downside risk for beneficiaries and recipients. So we try to balance those two things together to get the best outcomes for contributors and beneficiaries in the near term and in the long term. The total portfolio approach means that we look beyond the asset class labels and try to identify what are the risk return factors that drive returns for different investments. Principally, these are economic drivers, things like GDP growth, the business cycle, interest rates, inflation, the way in which those broad economic factors affect asset returns. And we try to design a portfolio that's quite balanced across all those various economic factors. The reason for that is that they often behave in quite different ways. So by having a balanced set of exposures, we get a more resilient portfolio that's better diversified and more able to deliver on our mandate. Diversification is the most powerful way to mitigate market downturns and enhance investment returns. It helps to build a resilient portfolio. And the way diversification works is effectively it means that you are investing in assets and sectors and companies that don't move together all at the same time. One asset may be doing well and another asset is not doing so well and there's a kind of a natural offset or, or a bit of insurance or hedge that comes from diversification. You could think of it as essentially meaning that we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. We're putting our eggs in a lot of different baskets. If a given country is doing poorly and you can't be sure in advance whether that will happen, you've also invested in another country that's doing well. The same thing would be true with particular companies. And this enables us to have a more resilient portfolio. To determine how resilient our portfolio is, we perform stress tests to see how it will react under various scenarios. And then, COVID hit. Market crisis due to COVID-19 in March was unprecedented. However, in a crisis like that, you just really discover whether the diversification is working. And the diversification in our portfolio worked as intended. So our losses in the portfolio were limited because they are offset by the outperformance or the gains from government bonds and the depreciation of the Canadian dollar. And it worked exactly as we expected. We manage the fund in a way that's responsible, disciplined, and consistent with our mandate so that there's sustained value added over the long term. CPP Investments also has in place robust valuation processes to measure the fair values of our investments on an ongoing basis. With a well-balanced and globally diversified portfolio, Canadians can trust that the CPP will be there for you today and for generations to come. On behalf of the more than 1,800 CPP investment professionals around the world and our board of directors, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We hope we've given you a better understanding of what we do and of our commitment to you, the more than 20 million CPP contributors and beneficiaries. We would now like to move to the question and answer session of our meeting. Hello, and welcome to all CPP contributors and beneficiaries in Ontario. We're now moving, as Heather said, to the final segment of this public meeting, the question and answer period. Before kicking it off, I would like to note that we are currently meeting virtually throughout all of Ontario, and would therefore like to acknowledge the lands and traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of Ontario. My name is Tara Perkins, and I'm Managing Director of, C of External Affairs at CPPIB. We're happy to host these meetings to provide you, the CPP contributors and beneficiaries, with the opportunity to ask us questions about our organization and the role that it plays in helping to ensure the fund's sustainability. 
I'm going to be moderating the session today, and I'm here with Michelle Leduc, Senior Managing Director and Global Head of Public Affairs and Communications, who will be answering the questions from you. Thank you very much, Tara. Before we begin, on behalf of the organization, let me extend our appreciation to everyone joining us today. As Tara mentioned, my name is Michel Edzuk and I'm Head of Public Affairs and Communications. I'm also part of the Senior Management Team responsible for the overall strategy and operations of CPP Investments. I'm here today in that capacity and really looking forward to take on your questions while sharing insights into the activities of the organization. We are a purpose-driven organization and I can't think of any other ways to make this more real than the opportunity to engage with the public we serve. While this is my fifth set of public meetings, it is the first one for me in a studio rather than meeting you in person. Now that's another reason that I look forward to the end of the pandemic. Back to you, Tara. Thank you. And we do encourage you to um, submit questions. If you have one, you can do so by clicking on the tab at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Uh, thank you to all of you who submitted questions in advance. We received quite a few of them. We want to ensure we have enough time today for live questions, so we're conscious we won't be able to get to all of the questions during this meeting, but we will keep and review all of them. And in keeping with our protocols, we're going to uh, try to get back to you by email in a timely manner. So Michelle, just looking, why don't we um, kick off with a question that we're receiving quite a few on this topic. And it's, given what's happening in China with two Canadians being detained, why is CPP Investments investing there? Great. Thank you, Tara. And thank you very much for those questions. I do know that we've received quite a few of them. We received many questions about China, and for good reason. Hardly a day goes by without a headline about China involving trade relations, human rights, and its relationship with both Canada and its relationships with other trading partners such as the United States. Let's be clear, we invest in China for three main reasons. First, it is one of the largest economies in the world, forecasted to become the largest in line with our long investment horizon. To help sustain the Canada Pension Plan, it's insufficient for us to simply expose the fund to capital markets. We must also look for growth. And China is a source of growth in the coming years. The investment outcomes coming from China tend to move uncorrelated to other markets, and it's important that we build that into our portfolio for the sake of resilience. We need to avoid situations where the entire portfolio, the entire fund, moves all at the same time, all at once in the same direction. Where one part zigs, we have to look for parts that will zag. The third reason is for optimal diversification to address the fund's concentration risk to Canada. This is only prudent, or specifically, we get diversification from spreading the portfolio across emerging and developed markets. This is all about never putting all your eggs in a single basket, but many different ones. Let me add a fourth important reason, especially as we look ahead to future generations. The risk of missing out. It's human nature to focus only on actions, what you see. Yet there are risks of inaction or omission. The opportunity costs of avoiding China for a fund like ours could have disastrous effects on the Canada Pension Plan. Keep in mind that we're not only investing your contributions, we also owe a duty to future beneficiaries, the children of your children. We can't singularly focus on the China of 2020. We have to think of 2040. If the fund were to completely miss out on two decades of growth, it's a price that future generations should not be burdened with. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, so another topic that we have a few questions on, why is the CPP investing in fossil fuels given one, Canada's commitment to net zero emissions by 2050 Two, that oil sand stocks are a bad investment. And three, that several global oil companies have recently stated demand for oil has peaked. Great. And this is another one where we receive quite a few questions, and not just ahead of the public meeting and not just now live, but also throughout, throughout the year. It tends to be defined in a very binary way. I think it's much more constructive to start on common ground. Whether you're working in Alberta's oil patch 
trying to raise a family, or you're a passionate volunteer addressing climate risk in Ontario, or you're a CPP Investments employee, we all want a cleaner, more sustainable planet. This is a shared goal that we all share. We agreed all with everyone that climate change impacts are real, they're serious, and they're happening now. Saying our job is only about making returns does not sit well with many. And it is not the complete picture in any case. Our contributions in the evolution of cleaner forms of energy is perfectly aligned with helping to secure the lifetime financial security of Canadians. Both of these goals have something in common, and that's sustainability. And that's the heart of what we do in our expertise. Yet the path is not as simple as the flick of one single switch. Many forces will be accelerating the pace of the energy evolution in the decades to come. First, there's technology and innovation for cleaner, more, more sustainable production and consumption of traditional fuels. Then there's the adoption rate by households, individuals, and corporations of renewable energy. And of course, domestic, global, regional, and international public policy frameworks that will be enabling the transition over time. We witness today many energy operators downstream, midstream, and upstream playing a vital necessary role in this evolution. Companies like Orsted, which has made the transition from traditional energy to renewable, which is benefiting all of their stakeholders, including CPP Investments, as a key shareholder. Disengaging now or starving energy companies just as they are managing through this important evolution is simply not optimal. In fact, we believe that it's counterproductive. Blanket divestment does not accomplish anything. Engagement on environmental, social, and governance is constructive. Engagement on company strategy to become sustainable in the face of shifting demand from their customers is constructive. And most critically, investing in the evolution to cleaner forms of energy is constructive. Walking away is easy, yet it's harmful to that shared goal that I mentioned at the outset. Thank you, Michel. So why don't we go now to a video question that we received, and this one is addressed to our CEO, Mark Machen. Let's look at that. I'm Ed Greenspawn, President and CEO of the Public Policy Forum. And as a future CPP beneficiary, I want to thank you for doing this, Mark. Our think tank has been spending a lot of time since the pandemic bring people together, conducting research about how Canada can rebuild in a way that will be even better than we were before. One of the issues that's difficult is trade. Uh, trade has become even more political over the last few months, and we can see this in our relationship with the United States, our largest trading partner, our relationship with China, which has become much more aggressive and has been our fastest growing trading partner. I'm wondering, Mark, how you see the trading system evolving in the world and how CPP will navigate these waters? Great question. So we were able to put that to Mark and we'll watch that now. Thank you for the excellent question. We track this quite closely to understand what it will mean for our various asset classes and sectors in which we invest or are looking to invest. And I won't make a hard prediction on what the future of the global trading system will look like, but we need to be prepared for whatever will happen. We're gonna watch very carefully what will happen post COVID-19. We also need to see what will happen with respect to policies pursued by major economies with respect to the WTO and bilaterally and in regional trading groups and particularly what changes might happen through the current US election cycle. We're seeing changes and we're prepared to calibrate as needed to continue and to ensure that we will achieve strong risk adjusted returns for our contributors and beneficiaries. And CPP Investments works to deliver these returns over the long term by building a really robust and globally diversified portfolio and across multiple different asset classes. 
Great. So Michelle, let's go to a question that we're just getting in. Um, with so many boomers drawing on the CPP, is there any possibility that it will be drained? The answer is no. Uh, one of the things that is as close to scientific as possible is demographics. So independently, when the Chief Actuary of Canada calculates whether the fund at the current uh, contribution rate is sustainable, it includes demographics such as the changing in the dependency ratio, which basically means more people who are retiring compared to fewer people working. And that has been a trend that has happened since the very beginning of the Canada Pension Plan going back to the late 60s. And it's some things that have had to be adjusted over periods of time. But currently, based on the contribution rate and based on very clear, predictable demographic trends, the fund is absolutely sus sustainable for the next 75 years. Great. Um, so another question. Crestone Peak Resources of Colorado is a private company 95% owned and controlled by CPPIB. Why did CPPIB allow the company to spend $600,000 US to support Republican candidates and causes in the 2018 Colorado state elections in contravention of its code of conduct that it shouldn't favor or disapprove of a particular political group or candidate? Great, thank you for the question. We know there have been some um, media focus on this particular company uh, in uh, the United States. Let me start by being very clear. There was absolutely no money whatsoever from CPP Investments that went into a political donation. And that's for very clear reasons. There is a distinction between the institutional investor and the operating company. We invest in hundreds of operating companies directly, as well as thousands indirectly or through, through the markets. The one thing that is consistent through those different uh, arrangements is the separation between investor and the operating organization. And we also have to keep in mind that a number of operating companies in many parts of the world, in different countries, engage actively in the policymaking process. A lot of these sectors are highly regulated, and it's a constructive part of policymaking. Um, and we see that quite significantly in the technology sector, for example, in the United States. However, again, what is very clear is there is a distinction between those operational decisions and upstream to the investment institution. Again, let me conclude with being very clear, no money whatsoever from CPP Investments went into any political donation whatsoever. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so on to another question, and I'll, I'll just note to the viewer who submitted this that um, the question was received in French, Michelle, and we've translated it. What was the impact of COVID-19 on the fund? Uh, so thank you for, for that question. As you've seen on, on some of the videos, uh, you know, CPP investments did not predict with precision uh, that there would be a global pandemic at this particular time. However, we did have pandemic-related plans. So we were actually very well positioned to pivot, pivot very closely. We have an exceptional business continuity team. We've been practicing some of our processes that we've, we've put into place over the number of years. We also have a very strong financial risk management team. So if you break down the different levels of what it means to run a global enterprise from operational, the safety of our employees, and the financial dimensions, um, I can assure you that on all of these fronts, CPP Investments is performing really well. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty. One of the uncertainties is we don't know with certainty whether or not the financial consequences of the pandemic will continue for months or years. Um, and we also don't know with certainty how severe it is. But what we can be certain of is we've got an exceptional team, exceptional processes, the fund is very, very sound, and we've got great people, and we're looking after our people as one of the most important assets of the organization. Great. So why don't we go now to one of the video questions that we've received for you, if we could just show that. My name is Camilla Sutton. I'd be interested to understand what CPP is doing to encourage the appointment of women onto corporate boards. Thank you. Thank you for that question. The first thing that we do um, on this important business imperative is leading by example. You only need to look at our own board of directors, the composition, the majority of which are by very talented women with a lot of expertise in governance. And as 
former business leaders, and they bring that to bear at every, every one of our board meetings. So we begin by leading by example as a global institutional investor that sends a very strong message to the companies we invest in and to capital markets. But let me also talk about why it's such a critical aspect of our business. Understanding a very complex world that we live in today from an institutional investment perspective requires diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, especially on things like risk management. And this is why it's very important for companies all over the world to be, pay particular attention to diversity, to ensure that they can uh, achieve those returns that we need to sustain the fund. CPPIB was created more than 21 years ago with the basic focus on exposing the fund, current money not needed for current benefits, to global capital markets. We rely on the performance of global capital markets for growth. If we believe there are things within the operation of global capital markets that are suboptimal, we have no choice but to take action. And if we see that there's a lack of diversity in pockets of sectors, specific companies, we are going to take action and we have been. We've been taking very assertive reaction to any company that we see that have very low diversity, especially at the governance level. And we voted our proxies, we voted our position at annual meetings to vote against any chair of a governance committee where there's no women on the board, and that has been exceptionally, exceptionally successful in achieving change. And we brought that to the world. I mean, as the video mentioned earlier, that has resulted in hundreds of companies taking action. So again, let me go back to how it's very important for the operation of global capital markets. We depend on uh, very strong capital markets, and we will take whatever action we need to improve those capital markets. Great. Another question that's just coming in, has there been any consideration in using CPP funds to aid in the support of COVID-19 emergency plans? Let me begin with what we're doing as an institutional investor. The most important thing that we can do for our contributors and beneficiaries is focus on our job. There are multiple economic dimensions to a pandemic. There are things that are happening that are horrible in terms of people's lives. There are things that are happening that are very deeply troubling in terms of people's jobs. And those are things that are happening in real term. But we also have to think about what happens after the pandemic. And one of the things that we have to always keep in mind is that lifetime financial security, people achieving uh, a necessary level um, of of a standard of living that is equal to what they have before working is actually one of the most difficult things for any human being to achieve with, with certainty. So by us continuing to focus on our long-term strategy to help the sustainability of the fund is exactly what we need to do to help through this pandemic. Next question, how much does ESG criteria factor into our investment decision? It's actually one of the single most important set of factors um, that we consider when we're making investment decisions. Let me remind all of our contributors and beneficiaries that we're not investing for the next 30 days. We're actually not investing for the next 12 months. We're investing for multiple years, in some cases, some of our assets for up to a decade or more. Environmental, social, and governance factors or the risks or opportunities associated with those are tend to things that play out over the long run. And because our investment horizon is exceptionally long, ESG factors are much more important for an institutional investor like CPP Investments than almost for any other investment organization. So it's for these reasons that we have a dedicated team that has a line of sight in, across the entire portfolio in looking at these ESG factors from the bottom up, very specific transactions as they come up, dynamically through, uh, through time as of, of our uh, portfolio companies, and as well in terms of a total portfolio approach in looking across the entire uh, portfolio. So this is uh, arguably one of the most important challenges and opportunities that we have. Um, we've got expert teams um, on this with, and with tremendous, tremendous results. Um, and, and it's something that we're gonna continue to improve over time. Okay. So I believe we have another question that we've received uh, by way of video. If we could show that. 
Hello, my name is Rana and I'm a resident of Mississauga, Ontario and the Executive Director of Future Fund. Future Fund is a national student-run not-for-profit aimed at empowering female students with the financial literacy knowledge, skills, and confidence they need to make informed financial decisions. Our question is, can you tell us more about the recent expansion of the Canada Pension Plan and what your role as CPP Investments is in managing this change? How will the expansion impact younger contributors and how will it affect CPP investments? Great, thank you, Rana. And I'm very familiar with your organization. It's one that's doing a great contribution around financial literacy for, for young people. Uh, I get really excited when I think about uh, the implications of the additional CPP, so the recent enhancements, because it made CPP investments exceedingly more relevant to young people. It's much more relevant to young people because if you're 18 today and you're just starting to work, um, whether that's to help you through post-secondary education or through um, other forms of employment, and you begin to contribute to the CPP at that time, and then you continue to do so uh, through your entire career, and then say retire in your 60s or earlier or later, uh, what that means is your contributions will become a much more important part of your, old, your own retirement pie. So if you think of a pie that's cut in three, you're saving at home personally, you're saving maybe through a workplace pension. And then the Canada Pension Plan is the third part. And, and it's quite elegant in that when you retire, the CPP, based on your own contributions, could replace up to a third of what is the average rate of industrial average of your pre-retirement income. So you would have then uh, fully maxed in a third of your retirement, a third hopefully of what you've been able to save through your working years personally, and then maybe some from your workplace, ultimately completing uh, the whole picture. And compared to the, the previous, the base CPP, so the, the fund before the reforms, um, that was set at 25%. Still very important, and it, a lot of people count on that, um, and that will continue to be um, an important part of the fund going forward. So this next person uh, thanks us for holding the public meetings, and they've been looking into the holdings of another fund, and they're worried about um, commercial property, particularly downtown, and they're wondering what our exposure is in that area and how we're thinking about it. Good, good question. Um, a, a number of people are asking questions about what are the things that CPP investments are invested in that might have had a disproportionate impact because of the pandemic. Um, and, and one of them has been, you know, people are wondering, you know, as they're walking downtown, whether it's in Toronto or any of our major cities, um, a lot of their buildings are not full today. Um, and so they're wondering, well, what's going to happen to the values of those, those buildings? That's a very fair question. Um, I would say that real estate is one of the um, one of those asset classes that I referred to where we have an exceptionally long investment horizon, like infrastructure, real assets tend, our appetite would be tend to think of similar to a very long duration uh, bond. Having said that, of course, they're being impacted um, in terms of in, in the short run. We continue to have conviction um, as, as real estate being an important part of any global portfolio. However, in our case, uh, you know, we're diversified geographically and diversified by asset classes. And then when you look at even the pie that's dedicated, say, to some degree to the risk, risk exposures that we want associated with real assets like real estate, even that dimension is very well diversified. So you think of things like commercial logistics. We're seeing a lot glo uh, globally, a lot of homes and households and corporations ordering a lot more online. Those logistics operations um, are necessary to ensure that that continues to happen. So even within areas of real estate that have been affected by the pandemic, there are other parts of our portfolio that actually are continuing to see a, a lot of upswing in terms of uh, contribution to, to the fund. And that's, that's the beauty of diversification. So this next one, a um, bit more comment than question, but maybe you can address it, Michelle. Um, they're talking about how they, they understand there's a lack of understanding about the CPP fund in general. There's some misinformation, and they're also saying it's essential to keep the management of the fund out of the public realm. Can you touch on those points? Sure. I, um, in, in, and I have, a, I'll admit, a bias in um, being responsible at CPP Investments with a great team um, of, of communications um, because it's important for us to be transparent and have very strong disclosure practices. So I'm obviously, along with my colleagues um, on a management team, very focused on transparency and excellent communications. 
the fund has become more complex. It's become larger. It's become more global. With that comes a lot of complexity and a lot of valid, fair questions. Uh, and so, frankly, we just have to continue to push ourselves to do an even greater and better job. Our job to be open and transparent and to inform, proactively inform contributors and beneficiaries about what we're doing, why is our strategy the way it is, um, and what is driving our performance, what are some headwinds. And so these are areas that I think I'm passionate about in terms of being as transparent as we possibly can. And of course there's limits to that because while we're a public purpose organization, we're also a 100% commercial organization. We're competing with very large institutional investors around the world, and we're trying for Canadians to punch above our weight in those hotly contested markets. So that means we're operating with a lot of commercial sensitive information. And we can't disclose some of those things because that would be uh, showing, if we were playing cards, it would be showing our cards before we play them. Um, and so we want to be transparent, we want to do a better job informing Canadians, but there are also some restrictions as to how far we can go um, with that perspective. Right. Um, so the next question is from a woman who noticed that Alberta could possibly withdraw from the CPP fund and is wondering, would this have much of an impact on CPP returns? Right. Thank, thank you for, for the questions. Yes, there's been a debate in Alberta um, about looking into the possibility and the merits of Alberta creating its own pension plan. Um, in all the provinces, um, it's in, within the right to consider these things. Um, you know, Quebec has had its own uh, pension plan. So these are, are public policy decisions that different jurisdictions have to grapple with and to consider. What I'll say is, you know, again, my, my own bias of working for CPP Investments, um, I can assure you that we are doing an exceptional job for the 2.8 million Albertans who are working hard um, we're doing our best to take their hard-earned money and to invest it for growth. Our track record, as I mentioned just before on the question in terms of transparency, is demonstrable. It's available to you. Uh, I think you know, earning a 10.7% over 10 years is very good. It helps uh, with the sustainability of the fund. Uh, we work hard to serve Albertans, and we are going to continue to do, to do so. Um, and we think uh, that that uh, is as, as best we could do is to just focus on investing money and do a great job for Albertans. So Michelle, we're receiving uh, quite a few more questions. I know we're down to about three minutes. Are you okay to go a little bit long Absolutely. in this meeting? Okay, sure. we'll keep going. Um, so another question, can you please explain the difference between the CPP and QPP as it relates to investment strategy and the impact on recipients of each plan? Great. So at a very high level, they're very similar. You've, you've got a, a pan-Canadian plan in the sense of all participating provinces except Quebec being the Canada Pension Plan. Um, and early on, the Quebec Pension Plan um, has its own plan for its own province. So from that perspective, there, there are two uh, uh, very similar plans. Uh, they, they have similar contribution rates and fairly similar benefits. Um, in terms of the specificity, we'll get back to you um, on those details um, after, after this meeting. They're invested differently. Uh, the, the QPP is invested by a, uh, an equivalent to the CPP Investment Board. Um, both organizations are professional, well-regarded um, institutional investors that invest the funds and exposes the fund across different asset classes around the world. There's one slight difference where, whereas the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board's mandate is singularly focused on risk-adjusted returns and other factors that may affect the pension plan. The Quebec plan has an added dimension to it, and it's also considering some economic factors for the province of Quebec. So that's generally um, the similarities and some of the uh, differences between the Quebec pension plan and the Canada pension plan. The next question, why when the pension fund has $434 billion in assets is only $6.6 .6 billion invested in renewable energy? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, one of the recurring themes um, that you'll hear from CPP Investments and that you would have heard um, in, in our beginning information is one of the most important critical things that we can do uh, as a prudent investor is diversification. And I also mentioned diversification has multiple, uh, multiple aspects to it, and that's geographic diversification. And it's also by assets to ensure that not everything in a portfolio 
moves all at once at, at the same time. So when you think of a $430 billion fund and you think of the multiple uh, you know, uh, ways that we've, we've diversified the fund, 6.6 .6 billion uh, may not seem like a lot, but a few things to consider. It's one of our youngest investment programs. So it's just getting going. Um, and if you look back to where we were three, four years ago, um, we were much smaller. So a, a team of very capable experts who've hit the ground running, have done fantastic investments. But what I'll say is they're just getting started. Um, and, and I'll also say we're, you know, the, the transition is one that is gonna be insight driven, data driven, looking at some of the core powerful factors that are, uh, that are moving or advancing the, this transition. Um, and that team will, will continue to be uh, very busy and, and I encourage you to watch their work very closely. I might just uh, address one quickly, if that's okay, Michelle. There's a sure. gentleman who's looking to um, figure out where he can find the list of our equity holdings. It sounds like he's he's found those in prior years and is having trouble finding it. The easiest way is actually just to put into a search or a browser uh, CPPIB holdings, and the page where you can find that link should be the first thing that comes up. But if you're having uh, any any problems with that at all, by all means, email us, and we will uh, we will send you the direct link. So another one, Michelle, um, does the CPP hold investments in long-term care homes in Canada and other countries? If so, what steps is it taking to ensure they meet all standards? Thank you. To the best of my knowledge, I don't believe we have direct investments in long-term care homes in Ontario um, or in Canada. We may have very small positions um, if any one of those are publicly traded. However, we do have uh, some investments around the world um, in long-term care facilities. There's one in particular, a company uh, based out of France uh, called Orpea, um, an exceptional organization um, with stellar track record, um, as well as you know, very strong health and safety procedures. Um, and, and so uh, that, that's generally our, 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 um, our exposure to the, that particular sector. This is an interesting one. They're asking if there's other countries that have an organization similar to CPP Investments. The short answer is no, um, and, and uh, absolutely there are a, a number of countries who have different types of investment approaches to dealing with um, their, their retirement plans. Um, some of them tend to be split across multiple different funds. Um, others, uh, you know, may be focused on not necessarily a retirement fund per se, but investing the, uh, the wealth of the nation. Um, in, in terms of the model of CPP investments, it's, it's generally quite unique, and, and I would you know, suggest to you that it is considered to be not only uh, unique, but one that a lot of countries are seeking to emulate. Um, it's been up, upheld by a number of international organizations as the gold standard for investing um, a national pension fund, and it's one, frankly, that all Canadians should be exceedingly proud of. So the next question is one on an individual specific benefit. So maybe we can um, refer them to the resource page, but just in case you wanted to, uh, to comment further, um, she retired in 2018 at age 60, and she's curious about uh, taking her pension at age 70 versus age 65, essentially. Great, I, I'm not a financial uh, advisor, uh, so I'll be very prudent in providing you with, uh, with any advice. These types of decisions are very personal in a sense of it could de depend on a range of factors. Uh, uh, and I know that Services Canada, which is an arm of the Canadian government, independent from the investment arm, has a team of very strong, capable individuals who can help you navigate um, through some of those uh, very important questions. Um, and we'll make sure to contact you directly um, and facilitate uh, your ability to ask those questions. Um, for, for the right answer for yourself. Mm -hmm. And for other viewers who are wondering something similar in the resources tab on the left, you'll find links to Service Canada and other uh, relevant links related to, to pensions. Um, so another question, Michelle, this one's on emerging markets. Apart from China, which other emerging economies is CPP looking to invest in? What are your views on investing in India? Great. Uh, when we think of emerging markets, uh, so through one of our programs which it tends to follow a lot of national stock market indices. So through that we, we may be invested across a number um, of countries that would fall into the broad category um, of emerging markets. 
And then when we switch to our active investing strategy, which basically means making very deliberate choices, decisions that we have conviction over the long run will outperform a purely passive alternative. Um, our strategy is not to plant flags, and what I mean by that, it's not trying to go and you know, a, a buy companies or buy assets in you know, 50 countries. We believe there's a lot of value in developing long-term relationships, understanding the markets, being part of the business community, nurturing uh, partnerships uh, uh, it, it, you know, takes time. Um, for example, really understanding not only the nature of the assets in those emerging markets, but also understanding the long-term strategies. So because of that and not planting flags focuses uh, part of our strategy. Um, we tend to be focusing on a smaller range of emerging markets and, and India um, is absolutely at the core of that. Over the long run, we believe that India as an economy will continue to expand and grow over the next two decades. Um, other countries that um, we would be focused on, as mentioned, is China, um, as well as Brazil, um, and, and a range of, of other countries like uh, Mexico. So the next question is uh, someone who's curious how we performed in the latest quarter. So we don't, uh, for, for the sake of uh, transparency, um, and, and that, that in itself has value, we, we don't really focus on 90-day performance, and I would encourage you to not to put you know, too much stock um, on what happens in 90 day. We, we've had a, quite a, a strong quarter um, that we reported as of June 30th, and, and we'll, we'll certainly um, direct you to that, that press release uh, on our website. But the number that uh, I encourage you to focus on, because it's really what pays pensions at the, at the end of the day, is our 10 year return, so which is at 10.7%. Um, over the last 10 years. That, that's really what matters. That's how we think in terms of the decisions that we're making, not only strategically, but the day-to-day -day decisions that we're making in terms of the investments we're making. And so that's, that, because that's the decisions, that's what drives performance. But the shorter, uh, the shorter term are, are certainly available to you and, and we, will, we will provide that to you. So I know we're, we're over time, so maybe uh, two more questions because we might be losing some of our audience now. Um, one, another interesting one, what kind of investments would present a reputational risk? I would suggest, you know, because of uh, the wide range of, of things that CPP Investments um, looks at across, you know, every imaginable sector that, that you can think of, uh, reputation risks and impacts um, on not only our reputation, but impacts on the operating company that we might be invested in. Uh, you know, on the face of it, a company um, could look entirely benign. Um, it could look like a company that's providing you know, very valuable services. But in their operations, they might encounter employee misconduct or maybe this, uh, you know, part of their management team uh, erred in their judgment. Um, or, frankly, the investment just does not work out. Not all of our investments don't work out. In fact, if all of our investments worked out, we're probably not taking sufficient risk. As my colleague mentioned on the video, there's a risk of not taking too much risk as much as there's risk of taking too much risk. Reputation issues span almost every aspect of an organization. Um, we, at the top of, of the Q&A, you know, uh, certainly environmental issues is something that is uh, people are very passionate about, so it's very important for us to be very focused um, on that issue, social issues, and of course, uh, governance issues. But the most important thing is reputation is not limited to any particular theme. Um, it's one that we have to be very focused on across the entire enterprise, and I will say that it's something that we are very focused on. It is part and parcel of risk-adjusted returns. Um, and we look at every investment and direct investment and across the portfolio, what could some of the possible impacts be to our reputation and the reputations of the operating company? Um, and as well as it's not in a moment in time, we have also have to look and foreshadow uh, potential challenges. So it's very important as an institution that's um, investing all over the world to be cognizant of the power of our own brand um, and a reputation um, as, as we deploy capital and, and have relationships. So thank you for the question. So a final question. Um, if the CPP becomes unsustainable, would plan members be negatively impacted or would the federal government guarantee the payment of the income? 
Let me begin with emphasizing that the, the sustainability of the plan um, is considered uh, through a lot of analysis, a lot of deep assessments, um, independently of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board and independently of the operation of the Canada Pension Plan program itself. And it's done by the uh, chief um, actuary of Canada, looking at all sorts of economic, demographic, investment factors based on the most recent report um, looking at the most recent three-year period, the fund is sustainable at the current contribution rate for the next 75 years. All sorts of black, ones, uh, black swans can happen, and of course we can't predict every aspect of the future. We do expect from time to time downward pressure on the fund, um, and the fund's sustainability actually uh, assumes that in, in, in terms of uh, continuing to be able to pay out pensions. So right now we, all, we assume that difficult things will happen from time to time. Having said that, if there were to be something very, uh, you know, for a long period of time, a long duration, downward pressure um, on either the contribution or the performance of investment, there are mechanisms in place to look at the contribution rate to see if it should be adjusted to ensure the sustainability of the fund. So that would be one dimension that would keep the fund and the pension plan on track. Right. So that's the end of our question and answer session. Thank you for doing that and thank you for the extra Thank you, time. Tara. And thank you very much for your questions. Um, unfortunately, as Tara mentioned, we could not answer all of them. Um, yet we will be responding to you by email in the coming weeks. We want to make sure that we get to um, every question. Um, and we deeply appreciate your, your particip participation. I know there, there are many of you who've, um, who've logged on uh, and that means a lot to us because you know, we serve you um, and then that's important and we appreciate the engagement. Um, we hope that it helped you become more familiar with CPP investments and the fund's sustainability over that long run. Um, we also invite you to complete the short survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the broadcast. And on behalf of the board of directors, the senior management team, and all of our employees, thank you again for your participation. Be well and stay safe.